So what I was going to do first is just go over some of the solutions briefly from last week. So I'll just... Um, so um, the first thing we talked about um, last week, uh, the first exercise, was um, this fractals exercise. And I actually, the results uh, from the fractals exercise were just tacked on to the end. So I gave this lecture last week, but I'll just um, go back... So just briefly, the, the idea of the fractals exercise was, was to talk about, to illustrate this parallel pattern of a task farm where you have a, a master um, a controller process who uh, distributes work to a bunch of workers who return the work. And the idea here was that, um, to illustrate load balance. So if you have large tasks and a small number of them, then the, the, then the um, calculation is badly load balanced. Some, some workers have a lot more work to do than others. So the obvious thing to, to make the calculation go faster is to reduce the task size, have more tasks. But at some level, the task becomes so small, the overhead of distributing and collecting the tasks up will start to dominate. And so um, the, the most illustrative thing, I think, to do is to um, take a fixed number of workers. So here we're not actually I'm trying to get the lighting a bit better. We're not interested here in classical parallel scaling where you increase the number of... Uh, oops where you increase the number of uh, processes, where keeping the number of processes fixed here, the number of workers fixed, and looking at load and balance. And if you run on, I'm running here on um, 16 workers, um, which actually Im involves running on 17. The way the program was set up runs on running on 17 processes because you have a, a, the overhead of one controller process. But if you have, um, if you have 16 workers and 16 tasks, um, that means the tasks are quite large. Each, each worker gets 192 by 192 block to do. So they're already getting, they're, this is the worst load balance you can imagine. They're all getting one task. The time is almost two seconds, but the load imbalance factor is five. The load imbalance factor, as I explained, is the ratio of the maximum load to the average load. And it gives you a, 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 a ballpark figure for how much faster you should be able to go. So in fact, here, the load imbalance factor of five tells you you ought to be able to go five times faster if you balance the load. So you ought to be able to get down to about 0.4 seconds. As we increase the number of tasks and reduce the task size, you'll see that we do approach 0.4 but then we go up again. So when the tasks are very small, when tasks are four by four block of pixels or even down to a single block of pixels, the, um, the, the time goes up. And that's because although the load balance is getting better, your tasks are so small that all your time is spent in coordination. And so the graph here is just a simple plot of that. Um, for small number of tasks or large task size, uh, we get this very la long run time um, uh, of here almost two, almost two seconds. From that, we can predict we can predict what the runtime should be, which is the red the red uh, bar, which is the, the minimum runtime. And you'll see we actually approach, approach that quite nicely. So in the middle section here, the calculation is well load balanced, but also the overheads are controllable. But then towards the end, when we have too many tasks, the overheads start to grow again. And this turn up here happens quite far to the right. It only happens on Archer when you have tasks of, of, of a few pixels by a few pixels. Uh, that's because the interconnect on Archer, the, the network is very fast. Uh, in fact, actually, we're not even here going off a single node. But the, um, it, for, on a, on a, 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 a system where you were really going over, uh, communicating over a network, and where that network wasn't very well, highly performant, you expect that upturn to take place earlier. So that's really just to show you that, that, that um, this is a trade-off between load balance and overheads of parallelization. But in this problem, there's a large range in the middle where you get almost optimal performance uh, with acceptable overhead. So this is a picture uh, of, um, it's a bit bright in here, but, but uh, this is a picture of how it worked with 16 tasks. And you can see that the reason that, um, the reason that it was badly load balanced is that I said the black region is the region which takes a lot of time to calculate. So a, a single worker was responsible for the whole of this black region here and the whole of this black region here. And so that worker took almost all the time. But as you start to decrease the task size and increase the number of tasks, you see you get a more random distribution. Basically, um, initially you hand out the task. The color here, the shading illustrates who got the task. It's a bit, a bit hard to see, actually, on the, on the, on the screen here. But um, actually, it might be worth it. So playing around with the lights, yes. No, that's not going to work. Um, but basically, you'll see that um, you can see the tasks are smaller. You can see they're smaller here, and so you get better load balance. Um, so I won't go. I can leave the points up there. But basically, you can see um, 
that with one task per, per worker, obviously each square has got its own shade because they're shaded by, by who did the work, who did the, did, did the calculation. You get a more complicated pattern. And you'll see actually, maybe not very obvious, but the way that the tasks are given out is bottom left to top right in strips. And you'll see that at the end, the top bit is almost all the same shade. That means that a single worker did all those tasks in the top region because all the other workers have got stuck on difficult tasks. So somebody picked up all the stuff at the end. So you can still see it's not perfectly load balanced because presumably when that guy finished, some of the other guys were still working. But you can ascribe some meaning to the, the colouring. It's a bit difficult to see on the screen here. Hopefully on the PDFs it's a bit more obvious. The other task was to think conceptually about how to paralyse this traffic model. Um, and so I was going to go through this um, relatively uh, quickly, but just to out outline the key points. So there's two ways of... So this is the, the traffic simulation, and you can, you, can, um, you can think of it in various ways, but if you want to cast it as, as a cellular automaton, it's sort of a more formal... And the way I described it, you thought about moving cars, like moving pawns on a chessboard, but you can actually um, cast it as a more formal, formal kind of cellular automaton, where the state of each cell on the, on the next iteration depends on the state of itself and its neighbours on the previous iteration. So there are eight states we have to care with, from all full to all empty, and then basically we can say that you know, this is the situation where the car doesn't move forward, so it stays full. Here the car moves forward, so it becomes empty. Here the cell is empty, but the car will move in from the previous, um, from the previous cell. So we've got, this is how you would, if you would want to think about this more formally as a cellular automaton, this is how you would write down a kind of a, a truth table for, for the updates. Or you can write it as a state table, but I mean, it, it's not so particularly interesting there. But the important point is, if I give you some pseudocode, um, it's written in a language that's neither C nor Fortran nor Python. But um, what I want to do is, the, the way to, to, to do this calculation, because as I said, it's kind of an instantaneous update, in general you can't do the update in place. You can't update in place because you, then you get different answers depending on which order you update the cells. There are tricks for this particular example, but in general the right thing to do is to have a new array and an old array corresponding to the, the new array is the, is, is, is the next time step, the old array is the current time step. So I have two arrays, old and new, and the only other thing to note is that if you read the exercise, you'll have seen that I didn't want you to simulate a road so much as a roundabout. And the important point about a roundabout is it's closed. And so all that means in this simulation is that cars that go off the right-hand side or the left as you come back on, on the other side. So I have periodic boundary conditions. And the way I'm going to implement that is, although I have n cells, I'm going to declare the arrays to go from 0 to n plus 1. So I declare these arrays not to have n elements, but have n plus 2 elements. And that's going to allow me to cope with these periodic boundary conditions. So I initialize the arrays in some random way. Then I loop over the iterations. And the first thing I do is I, I, I set the boundary conditions appropriate to the periodicity. So what that means is if I set old to 0 equal to old of n, that means when I look down from old 1, I get old 0, which has been set to old n, which sets the periodic boundary conditions in that boundary. And on the other side, I set old of n plus 1 equal to old of 1. So that sets the periodic boundaries by copying, and I have to update them every iteration, obviously. Now, there's, there's a choice in this example. There's serial code. You might think, well, you know, why do that? Why can't you just have special code saying, well, if I'm at the end and I look up, make sure I wrap around to the start again? Well, it turns out that this is actually, this um, addition, these having these extra cells at the end, turns out to be ideal for parallelization in the, share, in the, in the distributed memory model. Because in the distributed memory model, where you divide the road up between different processes, what happens is these boundary values come from your neighbours. So you still have a step where you, you update the boundary values, but rather than being a copy, it turns out to require transferring information with your neighbours. Then we loop over all the, and we apply the rules. Um, this, this is, these are the right rules. Um, the reason that there, you might think, well, I thought there were eight rules, and there's only seem to be four rules here. Well, the reason that it, it collapses like that is... is, is um, if you're occupied, then you don't care about who's downstream from you, you only care about who's upstream from you. And if you're unoccupied, you only care about who's downstream from you. So although there are in principle eight rules, that you only have four rules in the code. And then at the end, having updated, I, I prepare for the next iteration in a fairly naive way by just copying old back to new. And the whole thing goes round and round. And this was basically the code. If you looked at the serial code, that's what I gave you out. So if I want to parallelize that using uh, a threaded parallelization, the first thing to realize is that load balance isn't an issue. The very naive way I've written it there, 
I'm updating every cell, regardless of whether it's occupied or unoccupied. I don't, you know, if there's a long block of unoccupied cells, I don't skip the interior ones. I just naively update every cell. So there's no load balance issues. If I split the road into equally sized portions, threads have equal amounts of work. So that's fine. So if I had a road of size N and, well, here I see P, P processes, I should maybe say T threads, I split it to N over T. For each piece, the rule for cell I depends on cells I minus 1 and I plus 1, but we can, we can easily parallelize this because we're updating, creating a new array based on an old array. Mm -hmm. So because of that, everyone is reading from the new array, uh, sorry, reading from the old array, but updating different portions of the new array, then there's no conflict between the threads. So within an iteration, we can easily parallelize. But we need to make sure we get the right answer, and synchronization is critical here, just like I described in that very simple example of, of just, just swapping a value between two threads. We have to ensure threads don't start until the boundary data is updated. If, I, if, I, if I'm responsible for the end piece of a road, I need to make sure the boundary value has been updated before I progress. There's a, we want to do, if you read the exercise, we want to work out how many cars move at each step. So that requires some global synchronization. But the most important synchronization is to ensure that all threads are finished before the next iteration. That's the, if, if you just um, start off a bunch of threads and say, off you go, update your portion of the road many times, then they may get out of synchronization. You will get the wrong answer because you'll be updating your road for iteration seven, but somebody else will still be on iteration five. And that's the major issue here if you do a threaded parallelization. And so in the shared variables parallelization, um, the, the first thing we have to do is, is decide actually what, what, what data is... Pro so I'll, I'll just go through the... Um, it, we have to de decide what the classification of the data is. Is the data shared or private? And um, in this um, simple code, we have, a lot of, we have only a few variables. We have i, we have n, and we have the arrays old and new. And it's quite simple. You get quite used to this once you've done this a few times. The old and new arrays are shared. This is the analogy of you have a shared whiteboard, you stick the big arrays up on your shared whiteboard, and you decide, right, I'm going to update the first half of the, of the array, and my colleague's going to update the second half. The large data arrays, this could be the map of the UK if you're doing weather simulation, are almost always in shared data. So large arrays are typically in shared because you all want access to that, but you, you will arrange for the threads to update different portions. So, so all the new are shared, and n is shared because it's just a constant value. It's not changing. So uh, you could make it shared or private, but it doesn't really matter. The very important thing here is that the loop variable i has to be, has to be private. The way we're going to parallelize this is by making sure that each um, thread operates on a different uh, section of the array. And that means that the loop limits aren't from i equals 1 to n, as we talked about in the analogy with the simple example of adding up an array of numbers, you maybe have an I start and an I stop, and they have to be different on each, on each thread. But, so, basically, I can do, I'm being a bit, um, a bit throwaway with what I'm by serial and parallel, but to initialize the old, to initialize the array, we can do that in serial. Initializing the array is something which doesn't take much time, and because we're in a shared memory model where every thread has access to the whole array, every worker Every office person has access to the whole array. We can just say, look, initializing the array isn't a big deal. Just, just nominate one thread to do it. And because of the shared memory model, you have access to the whole array. The loop over iterations is serial. Um, I'll come, uh, um, so what I mean by that is that, sorry, we can have one person, for example, counting the loop over iterations. We can, have, we can nominate one person in the, in, the, in, the, um, in the office to count the iterations. Then setting the boundary conditions, we can just get one, one thread to do it. So all these can be done in serial, but the important point is the parallel loop is the loop over the actual um, indices. So as I, when I said parallel here, what I mean by that is what you have to arrange is that each thread loops over a, a subsection of, 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 the, um, of the iteration space. So again, if we had two threads, one thread would go from i equals 1 to n over 2, and the other thread would go from n over 2 plus 1 to n. So we can do that loop in parallel, but the important point here is that you have to synchronize at this point. Because when you do this copy back, set old equals new, you need to make sure that every is finished. And it's not immediately obvious why that is. The, you might think, well, wait a second, when I, if, if I'm a thread and I've finished updating my section, why can't I copy that back? That's, I've updated the new array. Why can't I copy the back to the old array immediately? The point is that another thread might be reading some of the values from, the, from your section of the old array. 
Okay, because of this I, because each uh, cell I depends on cells I plus one and I minus one, you need to synchronize before you do the copy back. The fact you need one, the fact you need some synchronization here is kind of obvious. It's kind of clear you have to make all the threads operate on iterations uh, at the same time. You don't want somebody to be racing ahead of everybody else. But the fact that you need two synchronizations isn't completely, uh, completely um, trivial. And then we talked about reduction operations last time. To compute the total number of moves, we need a reduction operation. And there are a number of ways to parallelize that, uh, where you have a, a local accumulation variable, and then you, you, you globally accumulate into some shared, shared um, value. Uh, but you have to synchronize that appropriately. The message passing strategy, um, what I've done here is I've kind of illustrated a couple of, of inefficient message passing strategies, but I won't go through these in detail. But this is just to illustrate that you know, there, are, there are always more than one way to parallelize a calculation. And one way you might think about parallelizing the calculation um, for the traffic model is to, actually, is to broadcast the data everywhere. You, the, the difference about uh, parallelization and message passing is that all communication is explicit. If you want data from another process, you can't just read it off the shared whiteboard. There is no shared whiteboard. You have to make a phone call. Now, you might consider a strategy where you broadcast the data to all processes, but that turns out to be very inefficient, so I won't, uh, I won't go through that. More, more useful is that if what you would normally you would actually do is you would scatter the data. So in a very simple case where I have a road of thick length 8, you would say, well, each process is only going to have... Uh, four elements. So we split the road up into two sections of size four. These in, so these, if you look at that, each process can update these internal cells independently, but you get problems at the edges. If I want to update that cell, I know the states of that cell and that cell, that's fine. To update that cell, I know the state of that cell and that cell. But to update that cell, I need to know the state of that cell, which is on another process. And so... Uh, as is true in a lot of scientific and technical calculations, uh, once you split the calculation up, you require communication, but it only happens at the boundary. So, so the communication is, is, is bounded, is limited in some way. So you must communicate with your neighboring process to update the edge cells. And also, again, when we want to do this, uh, if we want to compute the total number of cars that have moved, each process can only compute that independently. We need some reduction operation. So we split the calculation between two processes, and then... Each process must know which part of the roadway it's updating, and we need a synchronization at the completion of each iteration to obtain the total number of moves. But what's more interesting is what the communication pattern is. So the same things are true here. Load balance is not an issue. But as I said here, for each piece uh, of the road, in general, if you have a road of length n and p processes, so you have n over p uh, cells on each process, then the n over p minus two interior cells can be updated independently. But it's these, these par the, the, the cells at your boundary are the ones that you have problems with because you don't know all the data there. And so you have to communicate. And the simple example, what happens is that you take what you want to get is this. If I start on the left, the correct answer is that on the right, where the first and the, um, the, the fourth and the fifth car all move. We split this between two processes. But just as in the serial code, each process doesn't just have a copy of the road. It has these extra uh, elements at the end. And they're typically called ghost cells or halos. Halo is a term which doesn't really make sense in one dimension. If you think in two dimensions, you, you would have a, a data array, and then you would have a ring, of, of uh, like a halo around your head all the way around. That's why they're called halo regions. And we saw in the serial code, each process could update these halo cells by, by copying. It's exactly the same uh, mechanics in the parallel code. You have to update the boundary conditions and then update your local road, update the boundary conditions and update the local road. But in this case, updating the boundary conditions requires communication. So it requires, when I say copy data to halos, what I really mean is you have to do message passing. So a message has to be sent where that data value is sent to there, that data value is sent to there, this data value is sent there. And that data value is sent there. And once you've done that communication, so you have an independent communications phase, once the communication is complete, you then have all the information to do an update locally. You can now update all the cells locally, count your local number of moves, of being two on the left, and, uh, oh, sorry, one on the left, and, um, and two on the right, and then you could accumulate them together to get the total number of moves equals three. But the important point is that this is, again, just with this very simple cellular automaton, you can see that it splits up quite naturally 
you split the data up between the processes, you require communication between neighbouring processes, which comes from the fact that each cell I depends on its neighbours I minus 1 and I plus 1, and it divides quite naturally into a communication phase followed by a calculation phase. And these halos are a standard technique in parallel programming where rather than just ask for the data on demand, at the beginning of each iteration, each, each computational phase, you say, what data do I need from all my neighbours to compute this without any extra communication? You do all the communications in, a, in one piece, and then you move on to calculation phase where you can compute things locally. So that was just a very brief uh, overview, and I've given you code uh, just to show you how this works in practice in the, in the, using MPI for message passing or OpenMP for threading. Uh, and uh, that's up on the web, but I, I won't go through it here. But if you have any questions, just you can just get in touch. So that was just a, a brief recap of what we did last week. What I want to do today is, um, oops, is to do a few things. So this is a change from last that I gave this like a year and a half ago. Um, previously, what I did was I gave talks on numerical computing, how computers deal with floating point numbers and what effect that has on um, what things you need to consider because of that. I talked a bit about random numbers, and then I talked about solving par partial differential equations. Um, this year, kind of ditched the partial differential equation stuff, and next week I'm going to talk about GPUs, GPU programming. I know there's a lot of interest in GPUs, so I'm going to talk about GPUs next week. So this week I'm going to talk a bit about numerical computing, which is just floating point numbers, and then I have a couple of lectures on random numbers. Now, the, the timing's maybe a little bit tight, um, so I'll go through the first random number lecture quite quickly, just picking out the main co um, concepts and spend more time on the third lecture, which is saying how random numbers are actually used in real scientific calculations, why they're needed and what kinds of applications they have. But I wanted to give this lecture in full about uh, talking about numerical computing, how computers store real numbers and the problems that result. So um, basically, um, when you declare a variable, in a program, you can have integers, but you can also have real floats and doubles and such like. And what we get is we do arithmetic operations. So what, what I'm going to explain here is, is how rounding errors uh, come in. That's what we're going to cover. So what we often write, we write x equals square root of 2. Okay. Now, square root of 2, which is 1.41, etc., 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 is an irrational number. Uh, how are you going to store that on a computer? How are real numbers stored on computers? And more importantly, given that, what implications does that have for calculations that are done using, using real numbers? Well, first of all, in an ideal world, um, in maths, integers can be as large as you want, real numbers can be as large or small as you want, and you can represent every number exactly. So 1 minus 3, a third, 10 to the huge number, 10 to the minus, all these irrational numbers. Numbers are ranged from minus infinity to infinity, and there's also infinite numbers in any interval. So in mathematics, you have an infinite range, and you have infinite accuracy. Okay? But this is not true on a computer. All numbers on a computer have limited range, which is true for integers and real numbers. But what's more important, and I'll concentrate on this lecture, is that real numbers have limited precision. Um, so that's what really differentiates the way you store real numbers on a computer from integers, is that you have a limited precision. There's only a certain accuracy you can store them to. I mean, um, the way... Um, the slight confusion with computers, of course, is that they work in binary. Um, we like to use base 10 only because we have 10 fingers. 10 is a very nasty number. If we had 12 fingers, the world would be a lot simpler place. A third would be a nice um, representable number, but anyway. Um, but what we do is we only have numbers 0 to 9, and we represent um, different powers of 10 by position. So when we write 1, 2, 5 from being a bit pedantic, what 1, 2, 5 means is 1 times 10 squared plus 2 times 10 plus 5 times 1, or that's 1 times 10 to the 2 plus 2 times 10 to the 1 plus 5 times 10 to the 0, which is 100 plus 20 plus 5, which gets me back to 125. And then we may have a plus or minus at the front. That's what we do. Computers, of course, are binary machines. They can only store 1s and zeros. And so in base 2, actually, this, this thing here is... I can move this out of the way. If I wanted to write 125, which is um, lots of 1s and a 0 and 1, it's just the same expansion except in, in, in base 2. It's 1 times 2 to the 6 plus 1 times 2 to the 5 plus 1 times 2 to the 4 all the way down to this, which adds up to 125. So, you know, 
Integers are quite straightforward. If you can think of yourself as only having, having uh, one finger as opposed to ten, the, the analogy is quite straightforward. Um, okay, I seem to have a slight... So if we have, if we wanted to store integers in one byte, which is eight bits, then we, we do have a problem, although we can store all the numbers between 0 and 255, uh, sorry, although we can store, you know, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, there's a limited range. So if we were to restrict ourselves to eight bit integers, we would be limited to between numbers between 0 and 255. So if we wanted to store a result bigger than 255, um, we would overflow and we get the wrong answer. Um, standard integers, st standard, uh, if you do int in C or Java or I guess in I don't, Python might be different, but definitely Fortran as well, typically an integer is four bytes. And so uh, uh, typically if you, if you see an integer in a, in, a, in a program, it can have a value between 0 and 2 to the 32 minus 1, which is about 4 billion. Um, is this a problem? Well, it might be. The biggest problem is um, when you're doing... Um, if you're storing memory addresses, so if you're going to if you're going to if you're going to address memory and store your pointers in four bytes, you can't address more than four gig of memory or or whatever. So this is a this was a big problem. I mean, again, if 20 years ago, if you said to somebody, "Don't store your pointers, don't store your memory address addresses in four bytes," you won't be able to use more than two gig of memory. People would have laughed. You know, who's ever going to have more than two gig of memory? Now that doesn't look so big. And so this was the big problem. You know, what is a 32-bit operating system? Uh, this is a, I don't, a mistake that some people, people think that 32-bit operating system means that integers are stored in 32-bit. It doesn't. 32-bit operating system just says that memory addresses are stored in 32 bits. Uh, nowadays, people like to store them in 64 bits. And so 2 to the 64 is a huge number. So typically, we, if, if that's not big enough for your integer, you can use 8-byte integers, 64-bit integers. They're normally big enough for most, for most um, uh, practical purposes. If you want to go beyond that, you'll need to use some, some, some multi-precision library. But for, at least for scientific and technical calculation, that this is normally good enough. Negative numbers, I won't go through. How, what, there's a trick to store negative numbers. Typically, rather than storing, having integers represent 0 to 255, we have them representing minus 128 to 127. And there's a bit of a trick, the way you store negative numbers, to two's complement to get, to get them to work out. But that, that's a bit of an aside, really. Um, so, you know, computers are very good at integer maths. Uh, you can add and subtract and multiply with complete accuracy, as long as you don't overflow. So unless you overflow, unless you multiply and get a number that's too big, you get the right answer. But then you have division, okay? So 4 over 2 is 2, 27 over 3 is 9, but 7 over 3, if I do int i equals 7, int j equals 3, and int k equals i over j, I will get the answer 2. So that might be good enough. But in most situations, it's not. And so how are we going to store real numbers on a computer? So there's a lot of ways you could do it. Things have standardized now. Um, what you could do is just, um, just um, use fixed point arithmetic. What fixed point arithmetic says is we just, we just scale every integer to some, to some, uh, some real number. So for example, if I store a value x between 0 and 255, I will say that represents an integer, which is x over 256. So I can represent real numbers between 0 and almost 1 in that, in that format. And so if I want uh, 5 ninths would be, would be represented by x equals 142, because 142 over 256 is the closest I can get to 5 over 9. And if you want to then, that's actually quite, that means you can do with these, this format um, where you just say, well, if I have an integer x, it actually represents the real number x over 256. Then to do, um, to do uh, real, real um, operations like um, uh, z equals x times y, then I can just do this quite simply because c equals a times b, if these are stored as, uh, as z equals x times y, the answer is just z equals x times y over 256. And so I can, I can do calculations on real numbers by doing the calculations on the integers and then dividing them out by the end. And so that sounds reasonably good. So between the upper and lower limits, 0 and 1, we have a uniform grid of possible real numbers. And for, for certain calculations, this is, this, is, this, is, um, this is sufficient. So if you know that your numbers are bounded in some range, 
and you also know you don't care too much about the precision. You, you know that you that that you know to being able to store two hundred fifty. You'd use a, a big a bigger device than two hundred fifty six. But I mean, then then you're okay. And this used to be true with computer graphics. People used to do computer graphics in fixed uh, point arithmetic because in computer graphics you can constrain you know, your world. There's maybe some some volume, and within that. You don't really care. If you can get the answer accurate enough to one pixel, that's all you need. You need to be able to get hit to color. If you know a pixel needs to be green, as long as you hit the right pixel, you get the right answer. It doesn't matter if it should have been 0.1 pixels to the left or to the right. That doesn't matter. So for a long time, this was used in computer graphics. But for scientific and technical calculations, this isn't, this isn't enough. Uh, so, so this arithmetic is very fast, but there's a number of problems. We, we, we can't represent numbers less than zero, numbers greater than equal to one here. We can adjust the range. We could say, well, actually, you know, I, I, want, I want to store a bigger range, but it's at the cost of precision. Okay? The bigger the range I have, the worse the, the, the accuracy I have, because I have a fixed number of different uh, numbers I can represent. So what would you do in, um, um, how, how, do we, how are we going to store, given we have fixed memory, fixed, fixed number of bits to store a number in, how are we going to be able to store a number of, of which can be, you know, 57 billion or 0 0.0037? Well, the way we write numbers is actually the, the key to that. If we have, um, if we have a number like 4261700.0 or 0 0.04217, how can we store these in the same storage scheme? Well, the way we write these down when we're doing, we're doing maths is to use scientific notation. So previously, the decimal point was fixed. Now we let it float. So what we do is, this is why they're called floating point numbers. We say, well, if we want to store this number, we let the, the, the decimal point float here to the left or float here to the right. So here we always write this as 0 0.42617, OK? No matter, these two numbers we store as 0 0.42617. But all we need to remember is how, how much to the left or the right we had to move the decimal point. So this part here is called the mantissa, and this part is called the exponent. And so just when we write numbers down in, in standard sort of scientific notation, we always write them down as 0 point the mantissa times 10 to the power of the exponent. So rather than writing numbers like this, just on pencil and paper, it's conventional to write them this. 0 0.4262 times 10 to the 7 is this number here, or 0 0.4262 times 10 to the minus 1 is this number here. And so this is a very useful storage because A, we always use just five numbers, okay? Okay? Here, he, we're using the numbers to their maximum, um, maximum value that we only store four. In this storage scheme, we, we store four uh, numbers for the mantissa and we reserve one, one integer here between, between them, um, plus or minus nine, the way I've got it here, for the exponent. So we don't waste space storing the leading zeros. It automatically adjusts the magnitude of this number being stored. For example, so I have to pre-decide I'm only going to store really big numbers or really small numbers because I store um, how much I had to shift the decimal point in this exponent. Then this storage format automatically can cope with, with very large numbers and very small numbers. I mean, I could have... Uh, all you have to decide is how much storage I, am I going to reserve for the mantissa and how much I'm going to reserve for the exponent. So, for example, it just as I said, if I had five storage spaces, four for the mantis and one for the exponent, I make maximal use of them by, by storing it in this format. So, the difference here is that the fixed point storage had, had constant absolute error. Okay? You had a, for example, in my simple example of dividing numbers by 256, so a, a single byte, which would be 0 and 255, could represent any number between 0 and 1. The, the accuracy was always one part, 1 over 256. That was my, my resolution. Floating point numbers have a constant relative error. They have a constant percentage error. Because the, the, the precision automatically adjusts in a particular storage scheme, it's your percentage error. They will always have a 1 part in 10 to the 8, 1 part in 10 to the 16 um, uh, accuracy, which is probably what you want. So that's how we use scientific notation, just how we write numbers in this format, 0 point something times 10 to the plus or minus the exponent. Uh, the way that, that floating point numbers are stored in a computer is identical to that, but done in binary. So uh, it does make, can look a bit weird when it's done in binary, but it is an identical, identical idea, but it's just done in binary, not in decimal. And the important point is that um, 
This storage format has been, has been fixed in the standard, the IEEE standard, and that means that modern processors can, do, can deal with floating point numbers directly in hardware. So there will be, on a modern processor, there will be a single instruction at the machine code level to multiply two floating point numbers together, which to me seems incredible, because it's quite a multiplying, you know, two, two floating point numbers together is quite a lot of work. If you do it on a pencil and paper, long multiplication is going to take you a lot of time. That is encompassed on a modern processor, this wasn't true previously, on a modern processor will be a single machine code instruction to multiply or add or subtract uh, two floating point numbers. So um, the way it works in, 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 so this is the IEEE 754 standard, which uh, everyone complies to now, is that um, the, we have a sign at the start. So, so these are my bits, okay? I have, I, have, I have bits to store a floating point number in, and I decide, first of all, I have a sign at the start, which is 0 or 1. So 0 represents a positive number, and 1 represents a negative number. Then I have an exponent, which is stored in binary, and here I've reserved one, two, three, four, five, six, seven numbers, uh, seven bits for the exponent, and the remainder I leave for the mantissa. And there's a bit of um, there's a bit of uh, jiggery pokery that uh, the mantissa is 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 shifted. Sorry, the exponent is shifted. Just like I said, you know, if I have an eight byte number that represents naught to two five five, but I can shift that to make it actually that represents minus one two seven to one two eight. The way that is done is that the exponent is, um, to get the real exponent, you take the stored exponent and shift it. That's called the by. That's just the technicality. The important point about a floating point format is you have to decide, other than the sign, how many bits I'm going to give to the exponent and how many bits am I going to give to the mantissa. And the exponent is the equivalent of 10 to the plus or minus 3, and the mantissa is the actual, the, the, the significant part of the number. So um, there's something called the hidden bit, um, but that is just... Um, there's a bit of seems to be a bit of um, mystique around this thing, but basically, in this format, when I in, in decimal format, I always choose to, to, to store the number as naught point something. It's madness explicitly storing this zero. Why waste one of my precious storage? If the number is always zero, you don't store it. Okay. The equivalent in binary format is the mantissa is always stored as to be one point something. Okay. So the mantissa lies between one and two. This is in binary. Um, and so we don't store it. There's no point storing them. So, so by convention, the mantista is always between 1 and 2. That means the first bit is always 1, therefore you don't store it. So if the first bit is always 1, there's no need to store it. So technically, the mantista M is 1 point F, um, where you store the F and not the 1. Uh, there's a slight technicality here that means 0 needs special treatment, but that's a slight technicality. But it just gives you what, you know, if you've decided that, you're, that, you're, that your mantista, your number is always normalized between 1 and 2, you, you, you don't need to store that one explicitly. This is called the hidden bit. That, that's, again, a bit of a technicality. Um, you start, so, basically, you start coming up with things, um, um, you get things like binary fractions, which, which are, look a bit weird, but um, they're actually quite, quite simple. That um, if you wrote 109.625, okay, that is 1 times 10 squared plus 0 times 10 to the 1 plus 9 times 10 to the 0. And the numbers past the decimal point are the tenths, hundredths, and thousandths. So 109.625 is 100, 0, 10, 9, 1, 6 tenths, 2 hundredths, and 5 thousandths. It looks a bit weird when you start writing down binary fractions, but it is just the same thing. The numbers to the right of the, of the binary point, not the decimal point, represent halves, quarters, and eighths. So... 110, 1101.101, it gives you the same number, 109.625. I've fairly conveniently chosen a number here, which is exactly representable in binary. But again, they do look a bit, well, they look a bit weird to me, but actually, if you turn your brain off and just turn the handle, you'll see that it's just the same format. And so, um, there's a number of ways of, 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 of thinking about this. I, I won't go through this slide. There's different ways of thinking about it. But I think the most important point is, how does this translate... Uh, to, to real accuracy, and so the, the, you could make an arbit you could make for any number of bits. You could choose to have an arbitrary dis differentiation between how many bits represent the mantissa, how many the exponent. But the convention in IEEE arithmetic is a single precision number, which in C is a float, normally a float. Java would be a float. In Fortran would be a real. 
has got 32 bits, and you have one bit for the sign, eight bits for the exponent, and 23 plus one, 23 plus one bits for the mantissa. And in, if you do a double precision number, which is stored in 64 bits, eight bytes, you have three extra bits for the exponent and more than twice as many bits for the mantissa. And so, as I said, um, the, the representation of this is just, um, is just written out in kind of um, um, normal sort of scientific notation. But in binary, it's a bit difficult to interpret. But what happens in decimal is, if there's one takeaway message from this whole, whole lecture, is that if you have a floating point number, it has about eight significant figures. A floating point number, a real or a float, is accurate to about eight significant figures when written in decimal, and can have an absolute value between about 10 and to the plus or minus 38. A 64-bit um, number, which is a double, has 16 significant figures, twice as much accuracy, and its magnitude can be between about 10 to the plus or minus 308. There are some extended types, but um, they're not, they're not um, uniformly um, uh, implemented. So the important point about these two storage formats is not only they standard, but, as I said before, a modern microprocessor will have a single instruction at machine code level to manipulate floating point numbers stored in single and double precision. Uh, above that, higher precisions than that, you can declare, but they're probably not supported in hardware. They probably have to be emulated in software. So as I said, takeaway message is a single precision number is four bytes, 32 bits, eight significant figures of accuracy, and this magnitude. An eight, a double precision number is eight bytes storage and has 16 significant figures of accuracy. And you can see that by doing simple calculations. You can actually see the effects of these things coming around. So again, conventionally, they're called single and double precision. In C, C++ and Java, float is normally 32 bits, a double is 64 bits. In Fortran, which is a slightly more compli complicated type system, they correspond to real or double precision. Um, again, this has got nothing to do with 32-bit, 64-bit operating systems. I've heard people thinking, well, I'm on a 64-bit operating system. Doesn't that mean my real numbers are 64 bits? No, no. 64-bit operating system is, refers to how the, the memory addresses are stored. It's got nothing to do with the storage of real numbers or integers for that, for that, um, for that matter. So if I had a single precision number, I could print it out, and it would be accurate to about 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 significant figures. If it was double precision, it would have many more significant figures. The slight confusion you have is that, um, that C and Java seems to be compiler dependent, but don't know this when printing the default format. What I'm saying is, if I print out a double precision number, and I just print it out in a default format, it may print it with only about eight significant figures, despite the fact that there are more there. So it's sometimes you have to play around a bit to get these things to, um, um, to work out. So, so what... So, you can think about this as, as being a grid, for example. So, as I said, um, because you have a, only a finite number of bits of precision, you can't store a, a number arbitrarily accurately. And because of the, the way we've decided to store them, because these, real, these numbers have a fixed um, uh, percentage error in them, as the numbers get larger, the gaps between them get larger. So you can draw a grid here. If I wanted to store... Um, the, the, um, you have some ladder, as the numbers get bigger, the gaps between them get bigger. So limitations, numbers can't be stored exactly. And where you get this, um, where you get this um, coming out is that um, you can see it coming around um, when you order, numbers have different orders of magnitude. So the problem is you can store 10 to the minus 6 a millionth in single precision. You can store a million in single precision, okay? They can both be stored equally accurately. There's no problem storing the numbers. But when you add them together, you get a problem. Because if I add them together, a million plus a million is this thing here, okay? What happens is that this is one point, all these numbers times 10 to the power of 6. In 32-bit storage, we can't, we can't store all that accuracy. It gets truncated. It gets truncated to 10 to the 6, okay? So it's important to note that just because I, I can independently store a millionth exactly, I can independently store a million exactly. But if I add them together, I don't have enough resolution to store that number exactly. You might think, well, who cares? Well, you can get weird effects. 
And the weird effect is that on um, the floating point arithmetic <coughs> is commutative. A plus B is always equal to B plus A, but not associative. A plus B plus C is not equal to A plus B plus C. And that, what that tells you is the answer you get depends on what order you add things up in. And an extreme example, this is an extreme example, is that if I add a millionth to a million, in 32 bits, that's, that, that's rounded to a million. I subtract a million, I get zero. If I do it in the other, other order, if I sub do it a millionth plus a million minus a million, this is exactly zero, so I get a millionth. Okay? So that's an extreme example, but it does mean that the, 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 the answer you get depends on the order you add things up. And that may or may not concern you, may or may not um, give you... Um, give you cause for concern, but you need to be aware that, that that is the case. So there's a number of examples here kind of showing what, what how that could, just showing um, what can happen. So for example, this is written in Fortran um, because we wanted to, but what we're going to do here is we have four variables um, and we're going we're gonna to compute two thirds. So we've got a quad precision number, kind equals 16. That, uh, if Fortran has quite a sophisticated type system, but this is saying um, I want you to use 16 bytes of storage for this number. A normal double precision number, which has got 8 bytes, and a, and a, and a, a single precision number, which has got 4 bytes. And if I set them all to be uh, two-thirds, I then can do lots of, um, uh, over a large number of iterations, I can divide them by 10 and add 1 to them, and I can do the opposite, subtract 1 to them and multiply them by 10. So what I'm doing is I'm taking a number, I'm operating on it, and then I'm trying to come back down again. And in exact arithmetic, if I was doing, if I was doing pure maths, I would get back to where I started. So we start with two-thirds, we divide by 10 and add one, we repeat it many times, and then we do the opposite, we subtract one and multiply by 10. What happens to two-thirds? And you can see immediately, this is just printing it out, that I don't get back to where I started. I start off with... Um, um, Oh, I'm printing out after each. Okay, so we're printing out the first iteration. But I start off with uh, 1.07, 1, 1, and, and I end up with, I don't get back to where I started at all. I get back to some garbage number here. Because in the, in the middle, what you can see is, as I start operating on this number, the number gets, um, the, the, the accuracy I have just starts to get lost. The, 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 the um, accuracy I'm trying to resolve is out here in these, in these numbers down here, and they're being truncated. Remember, in single precision, I can't store more than about eight significant figures. Double precision, I do get better, but I still lose the accuracy here in the middle. When I get back down, I get down to 50, but instead of where I started from. If I use very high precision, quad precision, you can see that I can maintain all this accuracy, and I get back to almost where I started. Okay? So to get the right number here, I need to be able to store all this accuracy here, which is about maybe about um, um, quite a large number of, of, of significant figures. And if I use single and double, I get the wrong answer. So single precision, I get back to 53 million, which is the garbage answer. Double precision, I get back to 50. Quadruple precision, I get back to two-thirds. Because I need to be able to store, to get this calculation correctly, I need to be able to store 18 decimal places of accuracy. And neither single nor double precision can, 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 can store that. Um, this is the one I did before, where I, I and this is a more extreme example. This is using 10 to the 10. But if you take... Uh, minus 1, if I take uh, a number which is minus 1 times 10 to the 10, which is um, minus 10 billion, and B is plus 10 billion and C is 1, I can do a calculation such that I compute these in different orders. So I do, I do compute it as minus 1 times 10 to the 10 plus 1 times 10 to the 10 plus 1, or I do it in the opposite order. So I either add the numbers, the first two numbers together and add them to the third number, or I, or I do the first one and add them to the second one. Again, in pure maths, A plus B plus C is the same answer if I add A plus B to C or A to B plus C. But in finite precision, I get different answers. And so what's the answer here? Well, as we just, if I do it in float, I, if I do it one way, I get one, and the other way, I get zero. But in double, I have enough um, precision to store the, the, the number exact, the, the intermediate calculation exactly, and I get back, I get the correct answer, x equals 1 and y equals 1 in both, in both situations. So these are just sort of, these are kind of extreme examples, but they kind of illustrate what, what can happen. Um, there's another example here to do with calculating large summations, and I won't, I won't, I won't cover that one. Um, there are a number of kind of um, other 
bits and pieces. Um, zero has to be stored specially. You may have noticed when you do it, if you, if you get something wrong in the floating point calculation and print it out, you might print a number instead of getting 0 0.37, it might print infinity or not a number. You might see infinan. And these, although as a kind of naive programmer, I just interpret that as something's gone wrong, these are actually well defined. There are bit patterns which correspond to infinity or bit patterns which correspond to not a number. So, for example, um, if you divide a number by zero, then that gives you infinity. And so, uh, so you do, if you two divide it by zero, that's internally stored as infinity. So it actually remembers that's an infinite number. Not a number is, uh, comes up under another, another um, uh, situation. But the most common situation you get not a number is you try to take the square root of a negative number. So um, when you do something like x equals square root of minus 1, in real arithmetic there is no answer to that. But there is actually a bit pattern. It is stored that that number gave you an invalid answer. Um, so um, again, um, these can be um, uh, these are all standardised and can be useful for, for debugging. So if you start seeing not a number when you come out when you're running calculation, uh, and it's written as nan, that normally means, in my experience, you've tried to take the square root of a negative number. That's normally the, or or you've done something really dodgy like um, like uh, 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 read off into into random memory where you have sort of invalid bit patterns. So there was a couple of other um, it, um, special values which I won't go through. There's kind of tricks and, and, and there's various tricks and such like. Again, um, bits are precious. If you only have 64 bits or 32 bits, you're going to make the, the best use of all of them. And just to say, there are things called um, denormal numbers which are a bit weird, um, but they're useful, um, which are um, they're special bit patterns. Uh, which allow you to store slightly smaller numbers than you'd have first thought of. So this is called gradual underflow, and what it allows you to do is that for very, very small numbers, you're able to store them, but with with, um, with reduced precision, and it, it just gives you um, it gives you more control um, over um, it gives you more control over what you're doing. So this is just some 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 sort of standard. Uh, I won't go through these. Um, but uh, so denormal numbers are, need, are needed so that x minus y equals zero is the same statement as x equals y. The worry is you get to a stage where you say x minus y equals zero because the number because x and y were so close that you couldn't store the difference and that's rounded to zero and that would actually not be a very nice situation. So uh, even with floating point numbers, x minus y equals zero only happens when x equals y. If you, if you adhere to the IEEE uh, standard correctly. Um, you may ask, you know, well, we've gone to this effort so that, you know, with this floating point number storage, not only can we store all the numbers that we want to use, but also we have these special bit patterns which indicate when things have gone wrong. Um, what do you do if you get a special value? What, what, what happens if you, you come up with, uh, you know, an infinity in your calculation or one of these not a numbers? Um, you can usually control this by your compiler. So the default behavior can vary, um, but um, um, you know, often what happens is if, if you're halfway through your calculation, you get a not a number, your, your code may dump. You know, there may be, that will generate an exception, and, and our, our common behavior would just be to, to abort on that, to say something's gone wrong. But this can often, if you're lucky, be controlled by your compiler. And so um, you, can, you can decide to terminate when various conditions happen. And so you may or may not say, you might say, look, in my calculation, I'm happy if infinities happen. Um, or you might say, I want the program to, to terminate. And normally that, so that can be controlled by your compiler. What will happen is the processor itself will throw some exception when these things happen. But then it's up to you what you do with that. When you trap it, do you, do you dump or do you carry on? Um, And this was a talk about, uh, so this is some more details about, um, about, um, um, about, how, about some of the subtleties. Um, so most um, C and Fortran compilers are, f are fully compliant to the, to, to this, to the standard. Um, one of the things you have to watch about is, though, is there are subtle differences. And one of the things I said 
that A plus B plus C gives you a different, can, can give you a different number if you compute the A plus B first and add the C second, or you compute the, the B plus C first and add it to the A. How languages def, uh, cope with this varies depending on the language definition. Now, Fortran, which was written um, to be a numerical, a language numerical calculation, strictly says that, that, that these are evaluated left to right. But C, um, it's, a, it's allowed to modify the order during the optimization. So the C compiler could decide to do A plus B plus C or A plus B plus C, uh, depending on um, which, which it thought was the most efficient to do. So this could mean that the level of compiler optimization you use can change the output of your code. Okay? So, for, so, that, so this may surprise you when you're dealing with real numbers, how, what level of optimization you use can change the output. Because, for example, okay, the Fortran compiler sees this, strictly speaking, it's supposed to add A to B and then add C. The C compiler might say, well, wait a second, he's previously computed B plus C. I already know the answer of that. That's surely it's quicker just to add that pre-calculated number back into A, and that's a legitimate optimization in C. But that means you give slightly different numbers. And so if you are dealing with... Um, floating point numbers, one of the classic debugging techniques to check whether you've got a bug is, to, is, is do I get the same answer at, zero, at, 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 at optimization level zero versus optimization level three. At optimization level zero, compilers will typically just do what they see naively. At optimization level higher optimization level, they'll look for tricks uh, to get the calculation quicker. But you have to be aware that can change your, your output number subtly. So, uh, and and um, Java, I mean, if you're, if you're a purist, then, um, then um, Java doesn't support all the, um, all the IEEE 754 uh, standard, but that's just, again, that's just, a, that's just an aside. So, I mean, just as a summary, um, there's a whole bunch of ways you could choose to store real numbers, floating point numbers on a computer. But everyone has agreed on this standard, the IEEE 754 standard. And the two most commonly supported formats are single precision and double precision. And what I mean by commonly supported is that they were supported by your compiler, but also supported by the hardware. 32-bit um, gives you about six, uh, sorry, about um, eight significant figures of accuracy. 64-bit gives you about um, uh, twice as many significant figures, 16 in decimal. 16 significant figures of accuracy. This is the IEEE 754 an standard. And um, the IEEE 754 standard actually doesn't just define the storage format. It actually prescribes what the answer for any, floating, any operation between two floating point numbers, the output should be bit identical. IEEE, it defines completely what the, what the, what the outcome uh, of any operation is. Um, all real calculations suffer from rounding errors because we can't store even, even the number, you know, square root of 2, a third can't be stored exactly uh, in binary. And so what I, I'm not going to cover in these lectures, but I did a bit the last time, was that it's important to use algorithms where these are minimized. And so if you're doing scientific and technical calculations, a lot of the, um, the intellectual effort goes into defining algorithms, which don't just give you the right answer on paper, uh, in, in, well, on, in mathematically give you the right answer, but also which are stable against rounding errors which which don't which are able to cope with the fact that your numbers that this number might be one part in 10 to the 8 one part in 10 to the 10 different from what it should be um, you want to look for algorithms methods where where these rounding errors are, are minimized and the practical illustrate exercise uh, which again um i i um i don't have here because it actually it depended on the partial differential equation um um um, lectures, which I haven't done this year. What I have given you is just a very, very simple uh, piece of code, which I won't run, but I'll just show you. It's up on the website, where all I've done is, is I've just given you a very, very simple piece of code. And again, one of the nice things about, the, although these rounding errors and floating point storage formats can be quite complicated, you can see the effects with quite simple uh, quite simple um, codes, and so I've just given you a very simple code here where basically it computes the square root of 2 in single and double precision, squares that back up again, and works out how different that is from 2. How big is the, how big is, how, how wrong is the answer? So if I can just compute
and I can run it, you'll see that um, the, um, the difference, um, if I take in single precision and double precision, if I just print them out to the default precision, I don't see the, the difference. It looks like the same number. So this is illustrating that you have to be careful that although, if I don't print out to enough significant figures, it looks like the single and double precision numbers are, are, are correct. That the single precision number is this, and you square it, you get back to two. You don't see how many problems. So only if you print out to enough decimal places, you see there is a problem. That the single precision number squared goes wrong about here, and the double precision number squared goes wrong about here. If I subtract these from, um, from, from, from two, I see that, um, that, again, the difference seems to be zero in both cases if I don't print out enough double decimal places. Although, interestingly, actually, the difference here is minus zero, and the difference here is plus zero, so that might give you a hint there's something going on. But if I print out to sufficient precision, you'll see that x squared minus 2 is about 10 to the minus 7 in single precision, and about 10 to the minus 16 in double precision. And that, again, just gets across the idea that, that single precision is accurate to about one part in 10 to the 8, and double precision is accurate to about one part in 10 to the 16. This has got eight significant figures of accuracy. This has got, got, got um, 16 significant figures. So even just doing very simple calculations, like taking the square root of a number and multiplying it back up again, you can see where these finite precision effects come in. And you can also see that, that, that the errors you get are of the order of magnitude you would expect. So again, as a single precision number, you'd expect this to go wrong. This goes wrong in the after 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 there. And if you count it out here, it's about the 16th place here. And so you can see these effects coming in. But this, this exercise was written, just to reiterate, that you don't see these effects unless you print numbers out to enough precision. And in C, if I just print them out as if they were floating point numbers, I don't get enough decimal, uh, decimal points of accuracy to actually see the effect, which can be confusing. Okay? I've got a number here which looks like 2. I subtract 2 from it, I get a number which is, which is not 0. So you have to be careful to print things out. to the, And this is just to illustrate in, in C, C doesn't by default print things out to necessarily to the right number of significant figures. So I've, I've gone slightly over time there, but um, what I'll do is after the break, I'll, I'll, I'm going to jump tack a bit and I'm going to start talking about random numbers. There are two lectures there. I'll go through the first lecture relatively quickly because I said... Um, there's quite a lot of detail in it, but I'll pick out the, the, the key points. But the second lecture is, is, is um, hopefully more, um, is more general and more interesting. It's saying uh, why, in a deterministic field, what appears to be a deterministic field like computing and science, do we need random numbers? Why do people spend generate lots of random numbers? What kind of simulations are they useful in? And, and what are, the, what are the, the issues in doing that? What do you need, need to be able to do to do these stochastic or Monte Carlo simulations? And I'll, I'll talk about, I'll briefly introduce Mar Mar uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo methods through, through some sort of analogies. So I'll be back here at half past three. So thanks. But I'm going to talk now it's about random number generators. There's two lectures here. One is about how to generate random numbers, and the other is how to use them. I'll go through the first one. Um, Relatively quickly, because I said, unfortunately, I've had to condense these from the previous um, set of lectures. Um, this lecture is originally written by a colleague of mine, Stephen Booth, who is something of an expert on random numbers. Um, I've edited the, the, um, the, the talk slightly, so if there are any errors in here, I can guarantee you they'll be mine and not Stephen's. So apologies to Stephen if I've uh, made any mistakes here. So um, random numbers are frequently used in many types of computer simulation, and I'll actually talk a bit in the next lecture about where they come in. Um, but often it's part of a, a sampling process. You might want to, you, you want to have a, a large sample space, and you want to pick representative samples at random. Um, that's often the that's often case. That's a bit like, I mean, that's a bit like doing a, an exit poll, for, not an exit poll, like a, an opinion poll for, 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 for an election. You take a a random sample of people and hope it's a representation of the, of the larger population. Monte Carlo integration is a bit of a more formal statement. It's about doing an integral by sampling a function at random points. And I have a specific example about that to um, um, uh, the, the, um, um, the, uh, the, the example of how to do that. Um, and often, um, 
it might be simulating a stochastic process, like a random walk or a random chain of events. And I've got an example of that later on. You're sampling the possible evolutions of the system. You, so, so basically you have an infinite, potentially infinite number of outcomes, but you're sampling them to get some representative sample, and you want to do that in a fair-handed and even manner, and that's where random numbers come in. So hopefully we'll come back to that um, in specific examples later on. So, so randoms are very you know, difficult philosophical concept, how, how, how random do you think things here really are? But in, in a scientific and technical pr uh, program, what you really mean is unbiased sampling. What you mean is you want to select a subset of some, some population um, in, in an unbiased manner. And there have been lots of def definitions of what that means, but that's normally enough. Um, so random numbers come from a probability distribution. So if you had random integers, they come from, you, you've got a number of integers, x, and you want to pick each one with some probability, p of x. Um, for real numbers, this is some random number density, p of r. Uh, and so because it's continuous, this is actually a, a distribution. So if you really want to find what the probability of, a, of getting a, 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 a sample, the probability of getting a you know, particular number might be vanishingly small, but the, the probability of getting numbers in a particular region you can get by integration. But what actually happens is, most random number generators generate a uniform random number distribution. So basically, the way that most random number generators are implemented is they return a number typically between 0 and 1. They may or not include 0 and 1, but they will give you a, a, a uniform distribution between 0 and 1. Uh, and what you do is, given this, you generate other distributions from this. So it turns out that there's really two stages in, in using random numbers in any real uh, scientific and technical calculation. The first one is generating an in, a, a real number between 0 and 1, and it's uniformly distributed between 0 and 1. All of these numbers are equally likely, likely. And then you transform that to generate the random numbers you really want. And the reason for that is we'll see there are quite straightforward ways for transforming this, this, this um, uniform distribution into a distribution you might want. But also writing random number generators is very, very quite difficult. And so if you strip it down to a more constrained problem of write me a random number generator, which gives me a uniform distribution of numbers randomly between 0 and 1, that's a more tractical problem. And then you can tailor that for the specific um, distribution you want. Um, so the problem is that, you know, as we saw, computers use 30-point numbers. They're not true real numbers. So you can only generate a finite set of possible values that can be represented. So, you know, although you might, um, you might say I want to generate a random real number between 0 and 1, there might only be you know, billions, but there will only be a finite number of representable real numbers in that range. So any real random number has to come from this set. And in fact, um, most techniques generate an even smaller set of values. So what typically you do is um, a random number generator actually gives you an integer, x, which is between 0 and n, and you, you basically divide it out. So if you have a, a random number generator that gives you an integer between 0 and n, you can trivially transform that into a, a floating point number between 0 and 1 just by dividing by n. But you can see that the resolution of that generator is 1 over n. You are all, the, the numbers are going to have, you cannot differentiate between two numbers closer than 1 over n. Um, you hopefully have a uniform distribution that any number is equally probable in that range. Um, if there is always, so that means that the generated distribution is, is not uniform, it's only an approximation because you're only sampling at various particular points. Um, this may bias the results. Probably, I mean, it's one of these things that you can worry about it too much or too little, but it is worth understanding the resolution of the generator you use. You do need to be very, you need to maybe look at the random number generator which you use and, and know what its resolution is. Um, so a true random number generator are uncorrelated with each other. Okay, so that's saying that you know the pro no matter you know uh, what the previous history was, the new random number is uncorrelated with the previous ones. Okay, so it's like saying, you know, it doesn't matter if you've shown, thrown 10 or 20 heads in a row, the probability of getting a head if you're tossing a coin is still 50%. Okay? So the probability of getting a particular set of random results should be the product of the probabilities of each result in isolation. That's saying they should be uncorrelated. Um, now, you can build true random number generators in hardware. So, for example... Um, radioactive decay gives you random numbers. Um, you, can, you can build real random numbers by looking at thermal noise or quantum processes, things at a physical, uh, a, a physical level. But um, 
these are problematic for um, a number of reasons. The main reason they're problematic is if you get, you might say I want true random numbers to do my calculation correctly. The problem then is you can't debug the calculation because when you run it again, you get a different set of random numbers. So although you want random numbers, you actually want them to be deterministic. You want to be able to say, give me a set of random numbers, but if I ask for that same set again, I want the same set of random numbers. Um, and they're often quite slow. Um, and so these tend to be used, in, in my understanding, in cryptographic applications. If you're really, really, really concerned that you want a genuinely random number because you're going to use it in encoding some, you know, uh, using some cryptographic uh, encoding to, to, to protect some data, you might look up some hardware random number generator which would be based on, on something which is genuinely not capable of being reproduced. But in practice, most random numbers are generated in software. So these are strictly speaking pseudo-random number generators, not strictly random, they're pseudo-random. And the main point is that it's a deterministic sequence. Um, you have a deterministic sequence of numbers generated of some algorithm, and they're used in place of true random number generators. And hopefully they approximate real random number generators to some to, to, a, to, to a sufficiently high degree that they're useful, that they can be used for your simulation. They're not truly random. You could always generate some test which can demonstrate that they're not, they're not, that they're not truly random. But uh, in, in almost all applications, scientific and technical applications, um, we want to use pseudo-random numbers because A, they're good enough, they're fit for purpose, but B, the fact that they're reproducible is a good thing for debugging. And so, you know, how good um, you need your random number generator uh, depends on the intended use, okay? If you were going to use a random number generator to decide, you know, uh, which of two buses you got in the morning, whether you got number 38 or the number 23, you don't really care. You know, it's just a random decision. It's not really a big deal. Uh, other, other algorithms may, may require very, very high quality random numbers. They may be sensitive to correlations. Um, but people have worked on this for a long time. And the good thing is that there are um, available to you random number generators, pseudo-random number generators, which generate very high quality random numbers, which will be close enough to random such that you will get the correct answer in real programs. The problem is that the, often the, the random number generators that people use, the default ones that come with particular languages, can be fairly poor. So, that, so you have to be careful about these things um, that you should... Um, that you should not rely on the random number generator that happens to be recommended to you by your friend or happen to have come supplied with the language or the compiler that you use, you probably want to make sure you're using a good one. So if we have a logical way to represent random number generators, there are there's there's you have some internal state and you have an update transformation that maps one state onto the next. So that tells you that you're generating a sequence. You have an internal state SI, and you have some deterministic way of rep generating some new state SI plus 1. And then you have some output transformation on that state that gives you the random number. So you have some internal state, which can be arbitrarily complicated, but you just produce a single number, which is this integer between 0 and n, or, or a floating point number between 0 and 1. And, and so you can do various statistical tests on the output to, to, to determine how random they are, and that can give you some, some understanding of, of, of how high quality a random number generator are. But different algorithms can generate, so, so, so that because of the, um, uh, because of this differentiation between internal state and output transformation, you can have two random number generators that look different but actually produce the same set of pseudo-random numbers. You need to have some way of initializing the state and that's called seeding the random number generator. Um, so, and traditionally, um, they're seeded with a single word, a single integer. So you often may see in a, in, in a, in a, in a scientific and technical program, you know, see the random number generator with the number 574. And that gives you initial state. And so the, the sequence of random, number, num, random numbers you get from that initial state is deterministic, but will be different if you use a different seed. Although you may only specify a single a seed value, the internal state may be much more complicated than that. So there needs to be some way of, of, of generating the internal state of the initial seed. Um, if you don't generate a specify a seed, um, you may get the same sequence every time. The random number generator may say, well, they haven't specified a seed, so I'll pick a default value. Or you may get a different uh, value. So often the default might be generate from the current time. 
although that seems like a good thing to do each time you run the program, the seeding, the, the, the sequence around the numbers you get is determined by the time, which is going to vary from each, as in the time of day or the day of the week, which is going to vary from each time you run the program. That makes debugging very hard. And so uh, if, you, if you have a checkpoint in your program where halfway through you, um, you stop and you want to dump your data and be able to restart from that point seamlessly, you need to do two things if you're doing random numbers. You don't need to dump all your data arrays, but you also need to dump the state of the, of the random number generator. And note that is not, necess that is not in general just the, the most recent value of the random number, random number you got. There may be some very complicated internal state. So you need to check, check that you can do that. So a good random number generator will also have functions for dumping its state and reloading its state reproducibly. But it's very easy to get this thing wrong, so you need to, you need to check you're doing that. So we've talked about the resolution of a random number generator, you know, how fine its distribution is. But also an important thing is the period. There's only a finite number of possible states. You have an internal state, which, and you have a deterministic transformation, which turns out into a second state. That means that no matter how, much, how complicated your state is, no matter how many, how many integers or, 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 or bits you use to store it, that there are only a finite number of states. So eventually the generator will return to its starting state. So the size of this group is the period of the generator. How, how long do you have to run the, run the random number generators that come back to the start again? Um, so um, it's the number of valid states. And hopefully the period, of your, uh, the period of your generator needs to be much, much longer than the length of your simulation. So a good random number generator will have periods which are, you know, the length, you know, the, um, the age of the universe type. This, this random number generator won't, 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 won't re restart for a billion years, that kind of thing. But you do need to be careful that if you use a random number generator which has a very small period, you can basically, halfway through your simulation, get back and get the same set of random numbers again. And you may not notice that, but it will probably bias your results and give you, give you bad results. So again, not only should you know what your resolution of the random number generator is, you, sh you should know what its period is. And is, it, is the period long enough that you're not going to re start reusing the same random numbers? Um, again, because there's this two-state process, you have an internal state, an update rule, and then a, um, a transformation to produce the final number. Uh, you, 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 could, you could swing between two extremes. Um, the update transformation could just be a single update, i to i plus 1. You just label you know, what random number you generated, the first, the second, the third, the fourth, and the sequence. And then you can have a very complicated transform, which takes that and puts it into a, 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 an output number that looks random. Um, whoops. But typically, um, in practice, um, the output transformation is simple, and um, we have a much more complicated internal state representation. And it turns out that it ter very simple update transforms can have good randomness properties. So um, these algorithms are deceptively simple. They're typically made up from a few simple operations. And what they typically are are bitwise operations or modular arithmetic. And it's very tempting to take a published algorithm and say, oh, oh well, I'll just, you know, that looks, you know, I could change that a bit. You know, I could, you could, I could, they're doing it modulo 57. I could do modulo 95. What does that matter? You need to be very, very careful. To prove that a random number generator is, um, is good, uh, it takes a lot of um, proving, and it takes a lot of number theoretical, um, uh, and a lot, lot of number theory. And as I said, don't do this unless you really know what you're doing. So, I mean, I, I did this stupidly. I, um, for reasons which I thought were sensible, uh, for the traffic model example, which I actually distributed, I took a random number generator and I, I modified it a bit so that to make sure that I was always getting the same answer. Um, in parallel as it was in serial. I thought I'd done something sensible. It seemed fairly innocuous. Then I noticed the results from my simulation were completely wrong. And it turned out that it was generating initial distributions of cars which were very lumpy. For some reason, you know, it was putting, I wanted to, to have a, a density of 50% of cars, expecting it to be kind of a car, a car, not a car, a car. And the first half of the road was solid with cars and the second half was empty. And that was, I disobeyed this cardinal rule that don't take something which has been theoretically proved to be correct and make what looks like an innocuous change to it because you can get wrong answers. So um, another issue is that um, it's really horses for courses. Um, 
basically, typ typically, um, the quality of a random number generator is 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 um, computed by looking at the sequence of numbers it generates, and seeing that in that sequence, x i and x i plus one, the i and i plus one random numbers, are, are, are uncorrelated. Um, you have to be careful because other sets may be more correlated. Just because i and i plus 1 aren't correlated doesn't mean that i and i plus 1,024 um, aren't correlated. And so, again, that's a subtlety, but there have been a few classic cases where people have, um, uh, where people have uh, used random number generators. And for their particular simulation, you might be coupling the i number with the i plus 1,024 number, and you get wrong results. For example... If you have a 2D grid, which is 1,024 by 1,024, if you fill it up linearly, then the, looking down the way, uh, each number is next to I plus 1 and I minus 1 left and right. It's next, next to I plus 1,024 up and I 1,024 down. So in practice, you can worry about those things. Um, so you need to be careful. But generally, um, you know, People have done a lot of work on this. There are good random number generators out there, and you should use them. With, you know, you should, you should look up the literature and find ones which are good. So there's a bit of um, I'll, there, there's a bit of theory here going on about about how they work, but I'll really just do the um, the, the simple one and skip over the other ones. The standard one you see most um, most commonly is a linear congruential de generator. So you have a single um, um, state variable s. And the new variable is the old one times a value plus a value modulo sum m. So you multiply, you add, and you, you do a modulus to bring it back into a certain range. And if you choose a, c, and m correctly, then there are m possible states. Then this random number, the, the, the sequence will go through all, all um, possible states. And then this, surprisingly, it seems like a very, very simple update, but surprisingly, this generates a sequence which is, for a lot of, for a lot of purposes, are sufficiently random. Um, just some comments here. The Java standard, this is just a comment that you need to be careful. Um, the Java um, random number generator has values which are chosen for speed and not for quality. So they've picked values of A, C, and M, apparently, which are there to make it fast, but don't make it very, very, uh, don't make it particularly high quality. There's a few other uh, random number generators here, but I don't really want to, to go through them because um, it's not my strong field and it's not really that relevant here. But it's just to say that there are lots and lots of random number generators out there of high quality. And often they're really quite simple, although the theory behind them is very complex. To actually implement them in software is really quite simple. It's a few straightforward rules, transforming the state, doing a bit of modular arithmetic, and you get a, you get a good, um, you get a good uh, random number generator. So we've generated um, a, a random number distribution, but what ha which is uniform. So that we've got, a, imagine we have a random number generator which gives us a number between 0 and 1, where any random between 0 and 1 is equally likely. likely. Um, how do we generate a different probability distribution? We often want to generate a different probability distribu distribution, not, uh, not uniform, but you might want a Gaussian probability dis distribution, for example. That's the standard thing you might want to do. And there's three real ways of doing it. One is analytically, you can transform the number with some function which gives the right answer. Um, uh, the other is um, the other is to do it. So one is to do it tr analytic transform, and the other one is to do some accept reject accept reject step. And I think that the the easiest way to illustrate this is to take a specific example. So imagine we wanted to choose a random number x with probability three x squared. So what that's saying is, I want to generate a random number so that the high numbers are. So this is this is a graph of the probability. I want to get the high numbers more more uh, often than the low numbers, but by the probability three x squared. Okay, and I've, the, the normalization three is just so that the integral of that from naught to one is one. But I want to p pick random number of generators with probability proportional to the square of them. Okay, well, it is quite hard to do the. Um, you can do this analytically, and there's a bit of maths um, which can show you that, that, that for certain distributions, sorry, you can solve this equation uh, such that you, you can convince yourself that, um, that, that you, can, you can do the, the inverse uh, calculation. So, for example, um, if you have a P of X is 3X squared, 
If I take the cube root of a uniform um, a deviation, of a, of a uniform random number, then that will be distributed um, correctly. Okay? So that's maybe not immediately obvious. I don't have time to go through the theory. But for simple, for simple distributions like 3x squared, you can solve it analytically and say, if I have a uniform um, uh, variable between 0 and 1, if I take the cube root of that, that will be distributed according to p of x equals 3x squared. So what I did is I just uh, I did 100,000 samples in 100 bins. I've binned these numbers. And I said, all I did was my random number generate, my random number is the one I got from a, from a uniform random number generator to the power of a third. Okay? And if you see, this was, the, this was the distribution I was looking for, you can see that that gives me what I want. I mean, it's not a proof that it works, but it looks pretty, there's some fluctuation, obviously, because if this is random, but you can see that that works. So any standard textbook will, will go through the, the, um, the theory on how to do that. But it is uh, only for very, very simple distributions that you can do that calculation. The other way to do it is to do rejection. Okay. So what happens if we, we know for, for, for a given value x, I can tell you what the probability is, and that here it's 3x squared. How can I, um, how can I generate a random number with that distribution? Well, what you can do is you can pick two random numbers. You pick a random number which says where I am along here, okay, and then you can do an accept or reject step. So you can, you can accept that um, random number with the probability that you know. So basically, you, you select a random number along here. Okay, If you select one here, you know it's very likely, so you accept it. If it's down here, you know it's relatively unlikely, so you only accept it with a certain probability. And so all you do is you need two random numbers. You, you, you do a random number one and a random number two. You say what you want is three. Um, uh, so I'm just doing it. Uh, okay, yes. So I'm, doing, I'm basically accepting or rejecting this with, with, with the right probability. So I basically pick around the number um, RNG1, which says how long I am here. I work out what that probability should be, which is 3 times that thing squared. And if, if, if I accept or reject it with the correct probability. And if I, if, 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 if I decide that my second random number is, a, it, 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 I accept or reject that with the probability that I know. Okay? So that, what you're doing there is you're selecting a number along here. And you're saying, down here it's not very likely, so I'll only accept a fraction of them. Up here it's very likely, so I'll accept all of them. And so you have to accept or reject with the correct probability. The good thing about that is you can generate random numbers with any probability distribution. The bad thing about it is you may reject a lot of them. You can see here you're going to be rejecting more than half of them I get ge because I'm generating numbers effectively in this 2D plane and rejecting all the ones above here. But again, it is a general, it is a general, um, um, a general method. The, actually, often the most common um, distribution you want is kind of a normal or Gaussian distribution. Okay. Um, often, you know, quantities uh, like people's height or, or, or things like that follow a roughly Gaussian distribution. So if you want to generate a sample of random people with, with particular heights, you would want to generate them with some average, you know, um, five foot six or one meter, whatever that is, one meter seventy, whatever that is, and some standard deviation, but you want to generate a Gaussian. So this is a formula for a Gaussian. And that's quite complicated to do, but there are standard methods for doing that. And um, what you do here is you, uh, you generate two random numbers in the plane, and you do this transformation. So it's quite slow due to the math libraries, but you can, you can follow through the maths and, and, and work out that, that this gives you um, a, 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 the, right, the right distribution. Um, um, it gives you a Gaussian distribution. So again, you, you, all you need is the random number generator, which gener generates a uniform distribution between 0 and 1. And you can do this transformation and, um, and get Gaussian numbers. And this is called the Box and Wheeler algorithm. It's quite a standard algorithm. Um, and I won't go through. There's another variant which I won't go through here. So, I mean, the summary is that random numbers are key to many algorithms. I'll introduce some of them in the, um, in the next uh, lecture. They typically generate a random number in that range. Typically, random numbers, you'll have to check, but typically they generate them in the range 0 to 1, where they include 0 but not 1. 
you can transform them to other distributions, and there's really two ways of doing that. One is analytically, if you can go away and do the maths. The other is using accept-reject step. And it may seem strange, but repeatability is a key requirement. Although you have random numbers which you want to look random, you also want to be able to regenerate the same sequence to check that if you made updates to your program, that this, those updates perhaps improve the performance but don't, don't change the results. And so um, to be able to, to test the correctness of any computation, you need to have a reproducible set. And typically in a random number, that means by seeding it with the same value each time you run. What I want to do now is just to motivate um, you know, what kinds of areas um, in, in, in scientific technical computation do you, do you have a situation where you want to generate random numbers? Okay, where you need, this, you need to be able to, to approximate or sample from some distribution um, and, 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 where, and, and um, yeah, where do those come in? So this is a, why do scientists like to gamble? Monte Carlo methods obviously comes from you know, the, the analogy with a casino, which sounds like a bit of a uh, betting, doesn't sound a particular scientific thing to do. So the, the classic example is integration by random numbers. I'll just give you this very simple example of how to do that. But the more um, realistic example, which motivates something called Markov processes and, and Markov chain Monte Carlo, comes from very sharply peaked distributions. And I'll, I'll hope, hopefully motivate. I may not have enough time to go through the example. Hopefully, hopefully I'll talk about enough to give you some feeling for what these terms mean and, and why they're useful. So it, the, it seems like a bit of an aside, but often um, you might want to compute the area under a curve. And um, a standard way to do that computationally is simply um, to take the function and to split it up, the, the, the rate region between A and B, into a large number of rectangles with some width down to X. And so the area under the curve, which you'd like to do analytically, but maybe you can't do it, or if you're like me, you're too lazy to do it analytically, you want to do it computationally, you approximate it by the sum of the areas of all these uh, rectangles. There's, there's more accurate ways of doing it, but this is a very naive way. And you hope that as this width goes to zero, you get the correct answer. Okay? So if, you have the if, 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 the, if your sampling is, is fine enough, if your rectangles are sufficiently thin, then this integration which you've replaced by a numerical sum um, uh, will give you the, answer, the, the, uh, the, the exact answer. But the problem is in multi-dimensions, uh, 1D integration requires n points. But if we have a 2D integration, we're integrating the area on, under a surface, we have n squared point, points. And often, if, so if, if we have a large number of dimensions m, uh, we need to have n to the n points. And it turns out in the large number of scientific technical calculations, this, the dimension out of the problem is very, very high. And so this becomes very, very difficult to do. So we'll come back to that. But I mean, the standard way where you can do uh, use random numbers to to, to, um, uh, to to tackle this is rather than doing a, a uniform sampling on some grid, you sample randomly. And so, um, if we wanted to work out what pi is uh, using a Monte Carlo method, the standard thing you can do is you would say, well, the area of the circle is pi r squared. Okay, area of a unique circle of a unique square s equals one. And so, if you follow that through. The area, the shaded area there is um, pi by 4, um, and the total area is 1. So what you can say is, if I throw, ran if it's like playing darts, if I throw, if I have this dart, but if I throw darts randomly at this, at, this, um, at this area, the number which land inside the unique circle will be pi by 4. That's most of them. Pi by 4 is, you know, up in the sort of, sort of 80%, but not all of them. So the fraction of, of area that's colored in there is pi by 4, and I can sample that just by throwing lots of darts at this, um, at this, um, at this board. And so what I do is I pick a point randomly, and, if it's, and I count how many of those randomly chosen points lie inside this unit circle. So this is just basically, um, if I pick a random number, which is between a naught and rand max, I can just do this. I pick two x and y. I, I compute the um, uh, how far it is, um, the, the distance from from the from the centre, and if that's less than one, it's in the circle. It's out the circle, and then I can compute pi by by multiplying these up. 
And so if I have 1 to um, 10 darts, I get a value of 2.8. That's clearly not very good, but that's not surprising. Okay, it's just looking at, I've thrown these darts at this board, and the, the blue ones are outside. I have 3 outside and 7 inside. Um, clearly, I'm never going to get a very accurate result from 10 darts. But if I pick 100, I get pi of 3.0, which is a bit better. And if I use 1,000, I get 3.12. And that is starting to look like a reasonable approximation to the value of pi. And so one of the standard you know, ways of, of, of sampling distributions is to pick points randomly. And this is a very simple example where we know the answer, but if we sample this distribution randomly, the number that land inside um, this, this unique circle gives us an approximation to the value of pi. But the question you might ask is, how does the error vary? Okay. So obviously here, when I threw 10 darts, I had three, inside, three outside and seven inside. I got pi equals 2.8. If I'd done that, again, I might have got four and six or five and five. Okay? So I can, I can work out how accurate or reliable this estimate is by just doing it lots of times with different random number seeds. Okay? By choosing different random number seeds, I would get different, uh, just different sequences of random numbers and therefore a different answer for the value of pi. And if I run that, I can estimate the variation by doing lots of simulations. And you can see that with 100 darts, there's a large variation in pi. With 1,000, there's a smaller variation. And as I go up here to 10 million, the variation gets very, very small. So two things are nice here. As I use more and more sample points, the standard deviation, which is the spread and the answers, gets smaller. But also, hopefully, and more nicely, I actually get closer to the correct value of pi. So the standard question is, how does the uncertainty scale with n the number of samples? And if you just plot this, you'll see on a log-log plot that um, you get a slope of, I mean, we did it uh, numerically here, we got a, a slope of about minus a half, but there is, you can do a bit of theory, and the law of large numbers, something called the central limit theorem, says you, tells you that the error in your result scales as 1 over the square root of n. And so this is a really sort of, I haven't really, I've, just pro I've just kind of shown you a few graphs here to show this is true in practice, but you can look up any to textbook, and it'll, it'll give you some derivation of this. But it's very, very important that for all multicolor methods, the error in your result scales as 1 over the square root of the number of samples. Now, that is both good and it's bad. It's good because the more samples you use, then um, the more accurate the result you get. But it does mean that you have to, um, multi you have to go up to very, very large numbers of samples to get, to get a small error. Okay? To reduce the error by a factor of 10, you have to use 100 times more samples. And so that can be difficult. But that's a standard feature of these Monte Carlo methods to do with random numbers, that the, that the, um, the sampling error goes like 1 over root 10. So that's you know, the classic. If you ever look at any um, opinion poll, uh, if they're good enough to tell you what the error on that opinion poll is, which they normally aren't, but uh, they typically survey about 1,000 people. So the error on that is about 1 over the square root of 1,000, which is 1 over 30. So the error on almost any opinion poll you see in the lead up to an election is about 3%. And therefore, almost all the things they tell you are lost in the noise. They'll spend hours and hours and hours discussing why one party is used to be 1% behind is now 2% above. It's all meaningless because the error. But the problem is to reduce that error, you'd have to, you'd have to use, if you went to, you'd have to get to 0.3%, you'd have to go to 100,000 people, okay? So that's really, you know, that's the... Um, Sorry, you'd have to go to a, you'd have, you'd have to increase uh, the number by an enormous amount um, to, to reduce the error by a, by a reasonable factor. So, what's quite difficult to motivate here uh, is where something called important sampling. So, I've I tried to motivate this by using the traffic model. I hope this is a reasonable um, a reasonable example. Um, and I'll, I'll come back to, to wh where this comes in in real examples right at the end. But imagine that we're doing the traffic model, okay? We can compute the average velocity for a given density. I've given you a program, C, Python, or Fortran, that you can run it. And if you put in a, a density of cars of 0.5 or 0.4, it will run and, and then give you the average velocity. So for a particular, that requires a complete simulation, which actually required random numbers to generate the initial state. But that's by the by, we have a simulation program which for a particular input, which is the density of cars, gives an output which is the average velocity. 
What if we wanted to know the average velocity of cars over a week? Okay. Each day has a different density of cars because um, I'm saying that um, on Monday to Thursday, there's, there's, there's maybe uh, the density is 0.3. Friday is busy, the density is half, and the weekends are very, very busy, the density is 0.7. Okay? So if we wanted to know the average velocity of cars over a week, we'd have to run a number of simulations. Okay? And we'd have to then, we could use those individual simulations to produce the average velocity over a week. So a man with a clipboard has stood on these different days, and he's saying that four days of week the density is 0.3, one day of the week the density of cars is a half, and a, and a couple of days of the week the cars, have, the cars density is very heavy, that the density of cars is 0.7. What I could do is I could run a simulation for each density and compute the average by waiting by the probability of that density. So although there are seven days, I only need to run three simulations. I need to run the simulation at 0 0.3, 0 0.5, or 0 0.7. But when I compute the average velocity of the week, I need to make up for the fact that there's actually four days where the average is 0 0.3, and one day where the average is 0 0.5, and two days where the average is 0 0.7, where the density is 0 0.7, sorry. So the velocity of the week is four days, I do three simulations at density 0 0.3, 0 0.5, or 0.7. But to work out the average velocity of the week, I have to multiply this one by 4, this one by 1, and this one by 2. Okay? And then I have to divide by 7. So that's showing that basically I'm doing, a, so I'm doing lots of simulations, but my actual output result is a weighted average of those simulations because each one of those simulations had a different probability. It was more likely... There are four days where the density is 0.3, only one day where the density is 0.5. So in general, for many states, and we call the states something like xi, which is the density, and some function, what we need to compute is the expectation value. What, what I've actually said here is form now saying, what is the expectation value of the velocity? That is, what is the sum over n here is the of, um, all the velocities, so it has the probability of there being that velocity and, 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 and the value. So it turns out that there are a lot of situations where the answer, my, my subscripts have gone wrong here, that what we want to do is we want to compute something as the expectation value, which is the sum of the value of some function multiplied by the probability that that occurs. And here in this simple example, it's the value of the velocity, that's my measurable, and the probability of my my, um, my, my, my my state is the, is the density. So I sum over all the different densities, probability of that density, which was here 4 sevenths, 1 seventh, and 2 sevenths, times the value of the function, which for me was this, this, this velocity for that given density. And so in reality, we'd have a continuous distribution. We might say, well, actually, it's not as simple as that. The density of traffic between 0 and 1 has some um, some uh, distribution like this. Okay. So at this point, I could do. I could do. If I wanted to solve this problem, I could say, what? what what's the average over a week? Okay. Um, I have. Sorry. What's the average over, over over this probability distribution? I have to do lots of simulations at each probability distribution to compute the velocity which corresponds to that density of traffic and add them all together at the end. Okay. The problem I have is. But if I do a simulation here, there's almost no point in doing that. What's the point in doing a simulation at this uh, density of traffic? Because it's, it's, almost, it's almost inconceivable that will happen. The probability of that density of traffic happening is very small. Okay? So I could do that simulation, but then when I multiply it up by the probability, it has almost no effect on the result. So the problem here is that if the probability of, 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 of a state happening is very small then it's kind of pointless computing it because it doesn't contribute much to the, to the answer. And so what we would actually like to do is to make sure that we do simulations in the areas which are probable and not in the areas which are improbable. And that's called important sampling. So um, there's an aside here about flipping a coin, but I'll, 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 I'll flick over that because it's, not, it's just a bit of an aside. Um, so the distribution... Um, is often very sharply peaked in these um, in these simulations. Um, so, for example, I've shown it here that this probability of density of traffic being um, 0.5 is quite high. The probability of it being um, being um, 
this value here about 0.3 is actually very small. And it's kind of hard to motivate with, with, under, with that specific example. But um, um, the analogy is um, if I wanted to, to simulate the, the air in this room, okay, a way of doing it is to say, well, I don't know where the, the, the oxygen and nitrogen molecules are in this room are. What I'll do is I'll simulate a lot, a lot of possibilities of the distribution of air in this room and work out the, the, the answer I want to do. So you might want to say, you know, what's the temperature down in that corner there? You might say, well, I'll simulate lots and lots of possible um, distributions of the air in this room to work that out. One possibility of distribution of the air in this room is all, all the air being up in one, in, right in that top-hand corner of the lecture theatre. That's possible, okay? But the chance of it is so astronomically small, there's no point simulating it. And in practice, in real simulations that happens, these, these distributions are very, very peaked, often when you have high-dimensional simulations. And the problem is, it, it, if you do random sampling, okay, for most of the samples you pick, they'll have a probability which is very, very small. So you're doing lots and lots of simulations if you pick them randomly. Uh, but if you pick points randomly, the chances of it being a probable simulation are very, very small. And so what important sampling does is you generate weighted distributions. You generate a, um, a, a, just, you generate a, um, you sample the space proportional to the, the probability distribution. So what you do is you make sure you take lots and lots of samples in those areas of, 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 of the configuration space which are likely and not many in the areas which aren't likely. So the question is, so once you've done uh, with random or uniform sampling, a value is the sum over all the measurements times the probability of that happening. But as we said, in reality, if you choose these randomly, a lot of these will have zero probability. So in general, if we generate these, these samples with the correct probability distribution, then this weighted average just becomes a simple sum. All measurements contribute equally. Okay? So how do we do this? How do you generate a point in this, um, in this uh, graph where the probability of that point occurring is equal to, sorry, w w with where the probability of that point occurring is that and, and not here, okay? So you, all you know is the value of the probability at a particular point. How can you generate that point with a required probability? And we've seen that it's only for very simple functions um, that you can do this analytical inverse transform. But if you do this accept reject step, which I talked about, it's not going to work either because a lot of the points you pick are, are going to be rejected. And so what you do here is um, you do an analogy. So imagine that I'm walking in the Alps along, um, along, these, along the hills. So I have a function h of x, which is the height, and I have a position x. Okay. Imagine I want to spend my time in areas proportional to the height. In other words, I want to generate, I want to be at a particular point with probability proportional to the height. Okay? That's the same thing as generating my position x with probability h of x. If you walk randomly, if, uh, if you always headed uphill or downhill, you just get stuck at the nearest peak or valley. Okay? What I'm going to say is, we're going to, what we're going to do is we're going to take a Rather than generating the points independently, we're going to walk randomly in this space um, to, to try and explore the whole space. Okay? So we're walking randomly in this space, but we want to, to, to walk in a, in, a, in a directed way so that we spend most of our time at the high places. Okay? If we always headed uphill, we get stuck at this peak. If we always headed downhill, we get stuck in that valley. If you head up or head down here with equal probability, then you're, going to, you're, going to, you're not going to prefer peaks over valleys. So if you think about it, if you have a strategy where you take both uphill and downhill steps, but you prefer going uphill, you will spend more time at high peaks than low peaks. Okay? So there's two important things here. You don't always head uphill or downhill, because if you did that, you would get stuck. You wouldn't explore the whole space. But you head both uphill and downhill, so in a, in a, in a um, sufficiently long time, you'll explore the whole space. But you prefer going uphill. Okay? And that's kind of just a heuristic kind of argument, but it turns out that you can formalize that 
And it's a very simple algorithm that by doing this random walk, as long as you do the random walk weighted in the correct way, you can generate samples Xi with probability P of X. You can make sure that you, you stay in those regions which are probable with the right probability. And so the two key, um, uh, well, the, key, the key features here are is that X is no longer chosen independently. You don't generate uh, a new random number, a, a new position. You, you move from the old position. And that's why it's sometimes called a Markov chain. You're, you're exploring a space, but you're wandering randomly through the space. And so you're exploring it in some process where there's, where, where there's a, a link between the different samples. There's a chain of samples where each one is generated from the previous one. You generate a new value from the old one. So if I want to generate a distribution X with the correct possible probability, I take where I am, Xi, and I move randomly to a new position, delta Xi. And that's where the random numbers come in, at firstly. You're, you're doing a random walk through this space, and so you need random number generators to move around in this space randomly. But you don't walk completely randomly. You do an accept-reject step. If the place you're going is more probable than the previous place, then you accept the change, and that's saying that you like to go uphill. But if the place you're going is less probable than when you, where you are, you don't reject it. You ex and again, my, there's some um, issue with the, um, the, the indices here. You accept with probability of, the, uh, of P of X, I over P of X. So what I'm saying is, if I go back to my diagram, if I'm here and I, um, and I want, and I, I propose to move here, sorry, if I'm, if I'm here and I propose to move here, I always accept it because I want to go uphill. If I'm here and I propose to move here, I accept it with a, with a probability, which is the ratio of here to here. So I'd accept the going downhill by here maybe 80% of the time. So I sometimes go a bit downhill, I rarely go a lot downhill. But this, this, this concept of generating a Markov chain of states with a particular probability is you take your particular, your current state, you, up, you update it, you, me you, you, you measure the probability of the new and the old state. And if the new state is more probable than the, new, than the old one, you, you accept it. If the new one is less probable than the old one, you accept or reject it with a particular probability. And it's not obvious, but if you do this, then the asymptotic probability of X appearing is proportional to, to, to P of X. So that, it's not obvious, but you can, um, if you, again, if you look up a textbook, you can convince yourself that this is true, that uh, if, you, if you follow this prescription, then eventually you will explore this space and you, the, the variable X will be chosen with the correct probability P of X. So you need random numbers. You need random numbers for two reasons. You need random numbers to generate a new position because you're doing a random walk. But we have this accept reject we accept with probability, and any time you say accept something with probability, you need to generate a random number. And so this is called a Markov chain, because as I wander through this, in, uh, as, I, as I pictured it, the, 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 um, the, 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 um, the map of the hills in the Alps, as I wander through these things, I generate a set of states where each state, my position at, sta at, at step i plus 1 is, is, is generated from my previous position at step i. And there's a number of... Um, there's a number of conditions you need to satisfy. Um, and there, again, there's, there's deep maths that proves these things, but, but heuristically you can argue them quite. The update process needs, must be ergodic. You must be able to reach all x. Okay? Mm -hmm. Well, that's kind of obvious because to explore this space properly, I have to be able to, I have to, be able to, uh, to explore everywhere. So, for example, if I start here and I only ever move to the left, that's not an ergodic process. It doesn't allow me to get to this point here, and that's clearly going to give you the wrong answer. To sample this space and uh, be at position x with probability here h of x clearly requires you to be able to explore the, in the entire space. And so that, that, in statistical terms, is called being ergodic. Also, it takes some time to equilibrate. You need to forget where you started from. So, for example, um, you have to throw away, it takes you some while for this process to settle down, and so this is called the equilibration stage. And this, this whole process is called the Metropolis algorithm. Um, this accept-reject step is, is, is a very simple method for generating this Markov chain, which gives you the correct probability distribution. So you'll, you'll, you'll call, here this is called the Metropolis algorithm. And so the way that a Markov chain works, you start off with some arbitrary value x1, you update it to x2, x3, x4, x5, x6, x7, 
at each step, you accept or reject the change based on this ratio of probabilities. But the, two, the first thing you have to remember is you have to run for a certain amount of time, which is called equilibration time, for the whole thing to settle down. So you have to throw away your uh, initial, initial um, set of, of, of values till the whole simulation is settled down. Then you can start taking measurements. And so, for example, if I wanted to compute one of these averages, it would be sum over these 10 states of the value of the, of the variable for each state. And here, I, slightly strange way I've written it, but I, the reason it's a tenth is because there's 10 states here, 4 to 13. But I only start at state 4 because the first 4 was the equilibration stage where things were just settling down. Classic example where these Monte Carlo methods come is in is statistical physics. And statistical physics is, 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 is an, an analogy is exactly what I described. We want to, for example, simulate the, the air in this room. One way of doing it is to sample the, the, all the configurations of all the different molecules in, of, of oxygen nitrogen in this room. There's a huge not high dimensionality, the positions and orientations of millions of atoms. So what we do is we generate, we can't, clearly can't generate, even begin to generate all the, the possible arrangements of the billions of atoms in this room. What we do is we take snapshots, we, but we take snapshots which are all probable. We take snapshots which are likely, and we average over them. It's a standard statistical technique. Another, th more, in, in finance, um, another way, this is slightly different, um, different um, angle, but often where, where random number comes in is you have some Brownian motion. If you want to, um, th there's a price model called the Black-Scholes equation, which may have taken some, I mean, it's, it's a model, you shouldn't take it completely literally, but it is a standard way of mod modeling markets. Um, but there, is, there are lots of things you don't know. You don't know what people's decisions are going to be. You don't know how the market's going to react. And so the way you solve this equation is you solve lots and lots of, you take lots and lots of possible scenarios, each, each generated with random numbers. So you take lots and lots of possible scenarios and then try and measure some, you, you, you know, in different scenarios, you measure what's happening to the markets. So, you know, there's lots of complicated things going on in, 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 in financial models. People are making different decisions and such like. And the way you do it is that you basically you simulate lots and lots of different um, different possible um, um, situations, and hopefully you come up with some consensus result. Possibly a more understandable one, and it's very interesting, is, is numerical weather prediction. So um, there's a picture taken a few years ago. If you were in Britain, it was very cold there. Um, the problem you have, um, and this will be the last example I give, but. Numerical weather prediction, predicting the weather tomorrow, is um, very important. And it's so important that large organizations like the Met Office have their own dedicated um, um, supercomputers for running these simulations. It turns out the, the computer they have is very similar to, the, the, to Archer, uh, the supercomputer here. It's just a um, slight generation up. It has about half a million processor cores, and it's very, very powerful. This was installed a couple of years ago, but this is the machine. So they have this supercomputer for doing numerical weather simulations, for generating what is the weather today based on the weather tomorrow. And in principle, that's a deterministic model. You have a set of equations which, given the weather today, will tell you what the weather is tomorrow. Okay? The problem is that these equations are chaotic. So small changes in the initial conditions result in large changes in the outcome. So this has been loaned for a long time, um, but the butterfly effect, which is, you know, the flap of a butterfly's winds can affect the path of a tornado, is sort of the, 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 um, the, the kind of classic example that's used. But the real point is that, that the, the weather tomorrow depends, can depend um, chaotically on the weather today. Very small changes in the weather today can have very large implications on the weather tomorrow or week after. The problem is you don't know what the weather is today. You only have limited information. You might know what the temperature is from a large bunch of, of weather stations over the UK. You don't know exactly what the weather is today. You have limited information. So there's an uncertainty in what the weather is today. So how do you generate what the weather is tomorrow when you don't really know what the weather is today and there's an uncertainty in it and the weather tomorrow depends chaotically, very sensitively, on what the weather is today? Well, what you do is you do a lot of simulations. So a small perturbation in the initial conditions can lead to very different weather predictions, A and B. But we can use this to our advantage to estimate how reliable our forecast is. So one of the ways that, that, that um, one of the classic things that's done is called ensemble forecasting. It's actually quite, quite, 
quite um, quite a simple idea. To work out what the weather is tomorrow, you don't run one simulation, you might run a hundred simulations. Because you don't know what the weather is today, but you have some idea about how accurate your measurements are. So you say, well, maybe the wind, the wind, wind there is 5 meters per second, maybe it's 4.9. So what you do is you generate a lot of initial states, maybe 100, using random numbers, and then you run all of them and see what the weather is tomorrow. And so if you see, and actually probably, this gives you two things. It, well, it gives you some... It gives you some um, confidence of how reliable your weather forecast is tomorrow. So for example, if you see a weather forecast which says there's a 70% chance it's going to rain in Edinburgh tomorrow, the way that's been worked out is they ran 100 simulations and in 70 of them it rained tomorrow in Edinburgh and 30 of them it didn't. Okay? But that is, that's, that's the best you can do, but actually it's, actually a, very, it's a very, very um, powerful technique because if you just run one master simulation that says it's going to rain tomorrow, you have no idea if that, how, how, you have no confidence in that answer whatsoever. But if you run lots and lots of simulations with some initial perturbation in, 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 the, in, the, um, in, in the initial conditions, you get a distribution and a confidence of what your prediction is tomorrow. And that's actually um, much more, actually much more useful. So um, ensemble weather forecasting is a standard technique where you, you, you perturb the current conditions using random numbers to, to, to wiggle things around and then see what, what answers you get at the end. So again, random numbers are intrinsic to that process. You need to take the initial conditions and perturb them some way, maybe with some Gaussian weight, and then see what you get uh, further down the line. Um, the, I won't talk about the optimization. That's just a small um, uh, addition to the, um, um, to the uh, a, 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 just a very small perturbation on, on, on how we do um, the Monte Carlo sampling. So I apologize that was a bit of a run through, but I think random numbers are used in many simulations, which might seem strange when if you look at the equations or, or that we're solving. What they're mainly used to do is to efficiently sample a large space of possibilities. You're saying there's an enormous number of possible configurations of the simulation I want to do. I want to sample it. I have to subsample it. That's fine. But I can't take a random subsample. I have to choose a sample which are representative. And that's where Markov chain comes in. It allows you to simply, with a very simple metropolis algorithm, which says propose a random change and accept or reject it based on some probability, that guarantees that under certain conditions, you will explore the space with the correct probabilities distribution. And so Metropolis algorithm is a guided random walk. You explore the space in a random way, but it's guided by the probability such that, in my example of, of walking around the Alps, you spend mo twice as much time on mountains which are twice as high. You spend the amount of time, the, the probability of generating a state is directly uh, proportional to it, it, it to its Sorry. The number of times you generate the state is pr proportional to its probability, and that's called important sampling. Real simulations can require trillions of random numbers, and you can see that then you're going to need random number generation for very, very long periods. Okay? If you're going to generate trillions of random numbers in a simulation, you want them to be, to, to be um, never to repeat, but that is possible. The final thing you might say, well, parallelization introduces additional complexities. The, 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 the bottom line there is that um, what you'll probably do is you'll have each, in a random, in a, in a, in a, a simulation where you have a thousand processors doing the simulation, each processor will run its own random number generator. So clearly you're going to have to seed them differently. If you give each processor the same seed, they're going to generate the same set of random numbers, which is bad. But then you might argue, well, how do I seed two different um, two different processes so that the random number sequences are sufficiently different. You remember, a random, number, a, a, a random number generator generates a sequence, a deterministic sequence. So if two processes are just slightly, far, slightly displaced in that sequence, then they're going to generate the same random numbers, but just displaced from each other. The other problem is reproducibility. If you think about it, that means that, um, that it's not possible. That means that your simulation will depend on the number of processes you run on. Well, then we have a scheme where if you run on 50 processors once and you run on 50 processors again, you will get the same answer because you can get these 50 processors to generate the same random numbers as these 50 processors if they're seeded in the same way. Mm -hmm. If you take a simulation on 50 processors, then run it on 100 processors, that's going to be very difficult to achieve because you know, if you start off with 50 independent random number generators and replace them with 100 independent random number generators. And so that's very difficult to, 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 to um, 
that's very difficult to, to make it reproducible. You might say, why not just generate all random numbers on a single process? Well, that's going to be a serial bottleneck. You could have a reproducible simulation by saying, whenever I want a random number, I'll go to a, a processor, and he, that processor will give me the next number in the sequence. But that clearly creates an enormous bottleneck. And so that, that does induce additional complexities. So I said that was a bit of a, a, a run through, but hopefully it's given you enough of an overview that you can start to, to understand why we need to generate random numbers, why we need to generate, um, be able to generate distributions of quantities with a given probability distribution, why that's difficult to do in practice, especially when these probability distributions are very peaked, where most, if you, cho if you, if you choose sample points randomly, most of the time they will be They'll be just lost in the noise. They'll be completely unrepresentative. And so by using these, these guided random warp techniques, which are called Markov chains, the specific algorithm is called the Metropolis algorithm, you can generate these, these, um, the numbers with the correct probability dis distribution, and that's called, imp called important sampling. Okay, so that was a bit of a... Um, so next week, um, we'll move back a bit into... Um, um, so which may be more directly correct, connected to weeks one and two. So the, the last two lectures will be about um, graphic graphics processors, GPUs. So I'll, I'll explain um, why GPUs are being used nowadays in, in, in scientific technical computing, um, how they fit into the architectures we've talked about, and a, a sort of overview of the programming model we use to program them, which is slightly different from, related to, but slightly different from um, the shared variables a threaded programming model, which I've talked about, and I'll give you some sort of small examples of, of, of how you could, how you could, how you program how you program GPUs and what their applications are. Okay, so, thanks.